G'day ladies and gents, Cubic Media here. TNT cannons are pretty fun. However, the results are quite underwhelming. So let's apply a bit of quantum mechanics to go from a cannon that looks like this to a cannon that looks like this. So what exactly do I mean by quantum mechanics and how does this help us make a TNT railgun? Well, in Minecraft, there are certain mechanics that you won't quite notice just with your regular gameplay. After all, Minecraft is just a simulation running on a computer. And like any simulation, you can freeze it, you can speed it up, and you can slow it down. But the normal speed that you will see the game running is at 20 ticks per second. Now what a game tick is, is a lot like a frame. For example, my game right now is running at around 160 FPS, which is frames per second. And each frame is simply a snapshot of everything in my field of view. However, what a game tick is, is a snapshot of everything currently happening in the simulation. And these events are all bundled together and executed 20 times per second. But what you see is only the classical perspective. And this is what you will experience for most of your gameplay. So you hit a button that powers some redstone, which powers some repairs, which extends some pistons. But what's amazing is that Minecraft has its own version of quantum mechanics that operates in the background. And what I mean is, events happening within the same tick. What we see is all these pistons extending at exactly the same time. If we extend the delay on one of the repeaters, all those pistons will extend before this piston and we can visually see that. But in this configuration, which piston extends first? But we can't see that unless we do a special kind of experiment to discriminate which piston extends first. If we line up the pistons like this, we can do a special kind of experiment known as a tug of war. So if I hit this button, only one of these pistons will be allowed to extend. And it turns out that it's the first piston right here. But then what happens if we move the button? Well, now it's the second piston that extends. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. Because when I hit this button, what is the first component here to be powered? It's going to be this dust right next to the button. So it is the first to be powered. And therefore, the piston immediately adjacent to this redstone dust is also the first to be powered. So this gives us a way to visualize what is happening within a single game tick. These are events which normally you will not be able to discern simply by looking at them. However, there are experiments we can perform in order to discriminate them. And this is where I think the analogy for Minecraft's quantum mechanics is extremely apt because it is a level of the game which is not normally accessible to the player, however, it can be sussed out with very special experiments. And I always find it fascinating how below the simulation, there is a kind of subtick world with its own special rules. Like for example, if I hit this button, you'll note how this piston does not extend. However, if I hit this button over here, this dropper does get powered. And by understanding the natural underlying order of the way the game is processed by a computer, you can suss out these neat little mechanics that let you do very unique things. Most of my experiences in technical Minecraft have been trying to learn this rule set through trial and error. But fortunately, a technical player by the name of Spacewalker has written a literal paper about the topic. So let's take a look at some of the rules with Minecraft's quantum mechanics. We can quantize all the events which are scheduled to happen each tick. Here is the order they are executed. We start with the server receiving everything the player does for that tick. This means that anything that happens as a result of the player starts processing in the same tick. As you can tell from this list, the game has a lot of things to do. And considering that each element of this list can be broken down even further, let's just focus on the categories we are interested in for redstone and eventually our TNT railgun. We start with tile events. 
These are essentially redstone components that have some kind of delay and must schedule things to happen in the future. For example, repeaters need to schedule the powering of other redstone components in accordance with their delay setting. Or dispensers and droppers need to schedule their firing for full game ticks in the future. Anything that has some intrinsic delay can be found here. On the other hand, we also have block events. These involve pistons extending, retracting and moving blocks. A block moving technically has the delay of two game ticks. So when a piston pushes a block, it removes the block then schedules that block to appear in a new location two game ticks later. This is why the classic sticky piston monostable has a delay of four game ticks when extending and six game ticks when retracting. Block entities are used whenever a block stores a lot of information such as its inventory or special animations like a chest opening and closing. Block entities are separate to the physical block you can see in the world. In fact, a chest only exists as a block entity. So, if it doesn't have any data in it, it simply turns invisible. The reason the game must process block entities is to perform special functions such as their animations. Or, in the case of hoppers, a whole complex web of operations which makes the entirety of storage tech possible. We should also talk about instantaneous events. These are not confined to a specific phase of a tick. Instead, they are simply processed instantly whenever they are activated. For example, if I open a door with a repeater, the action of that door opening gets moved up into the tile event phase where the repeater was. This also explains the behavior of this circuit from earlier. By powering this repeater, the piston is quasi-powered, meaning it needs to receive a block update to realize that it's powered. The rail powers in the tile event phase from this repeater, meaning it should be able to send the block update to the piston. However, the piston does not extend because it cannot be processed until the block event phase. When we finally get to the block event phase, the sticky piston extends first, removing the power source for our piston, and thus, the piston does not extend. On the other hand, the dropper is processed in the tile event phase, which is processed before the block event phase, meaning the dropper is powered before the sticky piston can start moving, and so we see that the dropper spits out an item. It is an understanding of these quantum level mechanics that separates your average gadget man from a true technical Minecraft player. So, how can we now apply this understanding to blast holes through mountains? Well, TNT is an entity, and entities are processed here. When a TNT entity appears, it starts with a fuse of 80 ticks. Each tick, it will then decrease its fuse time, until eventually, we get an explosion. But what happens if two TNT entities are created in the same tick with the same fuse? Which TNT explodes first? Well, obviously, it's going to be the first TNT to appear. The game simply has a big list of entities, and whichever entity is the oldest is processed first. So each tick, both TNT burn down their fuse times, but when it comes to the final explosion, the TNT that was created first, explodes first. So what incredibly sophisticated mechanism have I been using to replicate this TNT railgun? Well, feast your eyes on... a nether portal. It turns out that when you're a technical player, anything that has a change of state can be a redstone component. And the reason why the nether portal is particularly handy for our situation is that we can light the portal, which doesn't actually update the observers, However, when we break the portal by dispensing a lava bucket into it, it does send an update to these observers, and the update propagates in an order which goes from the bottom corner right here, then it goes all the way to the front, up, across, up, across, and it has this sort of snakes and ladders progression all the way to the top of the portal. For testing purposes, I use command blocks just to make things easier, however, you could easily replace these command blocks with dispensers or just TNT blocks in order to get the same order in which they get lit. There is also a bit of foresight involved, because it turns out that the update order we get from lighting and breaking the portal from the bottom corner right here, 
happens to line up with having all of our projectile loads up at the front here and then everything that propels that behind it. So all we need to do to replace the command blocks is have all of our projectile TNT get aligned into the forward position then all of our propellant get aligned into the back position and then we should have a viable cannon. A little while later, with a bit of help from the TNT archives, we have a fully functioning TNT railgun. So if I hit the note block, it'll place down some TNT using command block. And you can see, it actually works. Needing to stock up the machine with TNT manually is probably not the best solution. However, this is merely a proof of concept. And if we log all the TNT that comes out of it, we can get ranges of up to 300 blocks away. Another funny thing that happened while I was testing this is that before I had the TNT properly aligned in the side to side direction, I got a situation where instead of punching a hole straight ahead, the TNT actually slid sideways into the mountain this way. This means it might be possible to make some even more advanced cannons that can not only dig in straight lines but can actually dig out entire planes. That would be a pretty cool concept to explore in the future, however for now, I'm just happy that I got a working prototype of a TNT railgun. If you enjoyed this little technical adventure, be sure to subscribe to receive notifications for new content. I will also be leaving a schematic of the railgun prototype in the description, so you can play around with it yourselves. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.